Hello, and welcome to Senior Moment. My name is David Refson. I am your host for the show. Senior Moment is about seniors and for seniors. I am very pleased to have as my guest today Professor John Bracey, uh, in the, who works in the Department of African American Studies at the University of Massachusetts. He has also been involved in the civil rights movement during the 60s and beyond. So, Professor Bracey, welcome to the show. Oh, glad to be here. Glad Thank to be here. You. Before we go in any further, uh, tell me about the uh, wonderful outfit that you're wearing. Oh, I do my shopping at the conventions I go to. So I got this last year at the uh, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And it's a combination, I think, of a Shante and a Nigerian form. Uh, so I really don't pay attention. I buy them for the aesthetics and not for the, well, for the symbolic. It's yeah. very handsome. If it looks good, then I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself, about the, kind of the early years, you're growing up. Um, tell me a little bit about where it was and what was going on in your family. Uh, okay. Time. Yeah, yeah. I was very fortunate to grow up in a family that consisted of the two major kind of uh, development trends in the African-American community after the emancipation. My father's family were railway workers. My grandfather was a mechanic on the Atlantic coastline. My father was a dining car waiter. Uh, railway workers were some of the highest paid people in the black community. So that's the kind of economic base on the working class, solid uh, black working class that, that enabled my family on my father's side to go to college. Uh, my mother's side of the family is uh, one of those typical kind of uh, Southern plantation families where my great grandmother was the mistress of a Dabney who owned the largest plantations in the Mississippi Delta. And he acknowledged his, his uh, uh, offspring, and therefore my grandparents and, and great aunts and uncles got to go to school. So from the late 19th century on, my, uh, my mother's mother and her and all of my great uncles and aunts all went to uh, college. They went to Tougaloo College or Berea College. Uh, and so I come out of my mother's side on a family of educators. They, they went to school and they went back to teaching. So I have like four generations of teachers in my uh, family, including a couple of college presidents. And so you have the economic base on one side and then you have the education on the other side. So I grew up in, in what would people consider to be a kind of black bourgeois family. This was Mississippi though? My mother's in Mississippi. No, I was born in Chicago. Chicago right. my people, half of Mississippi lives in Chicago anyway. Okay. Uh, and so my, my, my sister was born in Arkansas where my grandfather lived. Uh, he had to leave Mississippi because he didn't get the rights that his uh, wife had. The women got to move around without Jim Crow, but the men didn't. Mm -hmm. So if you married into the, the Dabney family, it didn't mean a thing. But if you were born, if you were my great aunts and so forth, they could they didn't suffer Jim Crow at all. They could go anywhere they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, but the men they married couldn't. So in fact, my uh, my grandfather uh, William Harris moved over, crossed the uh, right across of uh, uh, not Natchez up, up north, uh, right below Memphis. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they moved over into uh, Helena, Arkansas. My sister was born in Helena, Arkansas, in 1940. My mother moved to Chicago. I, and I was born in uh, Chicago in 1941. Were your, uh, were your folks involved in politics during those times? You know, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until later. Uh, you know, how would I know? Uh, when I stayed in World War II in my grandfather's house in Sanford, Florida, you know, the Sanford of Trayvon Martin, uh, there was a constant coming and going of people, but I didn't learn until much, much later when I was a grown-up scholar that my grandfather was active in the NAACP in Florida. And that some of the people coming into the house were people like Harry T. Moore, who got blown up with dynamite by the Klan. Uh, and yet my grandfather was active in uh, negotiating Jackie Robinson playing the first integrated oh, game uh, yeah. because the Montreal Royals were based in, you know, Dodgers farm team, AAA farm team, were based in Sanford. And the first integrated game I ever went to was the first integrated game in baseball. You know, it was Jackie Robinson playing for the Montreal Royals. I mean, I'll never forget that. I was five years old. Uh, I mean, up until then, I thought baseball was Negro Leagues. You know, Satchel Page and all like that. I'll tell you, I, I've seen a lot of information about the Negro Leagues. They had some of the greatest baseball players. That was baseball. Ever. I didn't think white people could play baseball, frankly. <laughs> uh, I was very surprised that they thought that white people were better than them. As they know. Uh, and Jackie Robinson was not an outstanding Negro League player. He was okay, but he wasn't like the best. 
And when he went to the major leagues and became rookie of the year, Red Ross said, like, if Jackie Robinson can make it, like, everybody ought to go, right? Uh, on the other hand, it destroyed the Negro Leagues. Which was really unfortunate, because they had a real big following in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, yeah. No, mm -hmm. I went to games with my father at Comiskey Park, uh, you know, double-headed, the, the stands were packed. They, they'd have a band between the, the games, so you, they'd put a, a platform out in, in the infield, and it'd be like Count Basie or some combo, and people would have a little dance between the first game and the second game. You know, uh, Negro League double-headed lasted like eight hours. It's like an all-day event, yeah. I, I, it's fantastic, yeah. to say the least. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful players. Kansas City Monarchs. Uh, I saw Satchel Page pitch with the Monarchs and then later with the Cleveland Indians when I was living in Chicago with my mother. At, he she was, worked he was quite there. something, Mr. Page. He's an amazing, an amazing pitcher. I know. Uh, and it's amazing to me that, um, that before Jackie Robinson came in that the world did not recognize the incredible players that were in the Negro League. I mean, and only because of him, once he opened the door up, the door started to be open. Well, actually, uh, the, the players knew, the white players knew about the Negro okay. League because they had, they had, during the off season, they would they play in Latin America. Right. You had a Mexican League, and then you had the, the, the Dominican, Trujillo, the dictator, set up a league in the Dominican Republic in order to make himself look good. So he paid these huge salaries to Negro League players to come down and play in the Dominican Republic in the, in the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, and so if you ask white players, the honest ones, they would say, we got to get these guys up here. Like Dizzy Dean said that about Satchel Page. He said, if you sign him, we'd win the pennant by July and go fishing until the World <laughs> Series. He said, he's the greatest pitcher I ever saw. Uh, Ted Williams advocated for Negro League players to come into the Hall of Fame. Really? And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, Ted Williams is Mexican, they, they, they ducked his middle name. Uh, but he advocated, he said, no, no, the best play, these are the best guys. He said, you should get them in. I don't care if they didn't make it to the major leagues, it wasn't their fault. Uh, well, and it proved to be true, because once the door got opened. They came right in, you full blast, yeah. Full I mean, blast. it really was. I mean, Willie Mays was my idol. Yeah, 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 I saw Growing Willie Mays. Out, he yeah, was yeah. like, uh, he was pretty amazing, along with, I mean, you got Don Newcomb, Ray yeah, Campanella, yeah. and I mean, there's yeah, so many. I saw, I saw all of them. They all came up because the Dodgers played exhibitions with the Senators in Washington, D.C. Right. So Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, all of them. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Let me ask you this. Uh -huh. um, uh, you had mentioned that you, as you got older, you, you were involved in the Civil Rights Movement yeah, yourself. Yeah, uh -huh. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, in my pre, you know, kind of growing up, my family tended to walk into places anyway. Uh, as any, before they had a movement, we would uh, just walk into a store or sit down somewhere uh, if it was segregated, just to do that. I mean, it never occurred to me as a big thing about that. Uh, they weren't part of a movement as such, just the way we, we acted about the world in which we lived. You didn't accept segregation. You know, I mean, the big things, you, could, you know, police and all like that, you couldn't deal with. But the, the, the daily life things you would challenge when you had an opportunity to do that. So I grew up with that kind of mentality. Uh, and I grew up on the campus of Howard University at the same time that the law school was developing right. the Brown case. And my junior high school history teacher, Ann Ruth Houston, was the cousin of Charles Houston, who outlined in order, the, the, the strategy to attack Plessy versus Ferguson. Right. So you're surrounded by people who are engaged in knocking down Jim Crow. Howard Law School was where they had the mock courts, where you could see Thurgood Marshall play a Southern lawyer, you know, just you know, funny accent and all. Uh, so I grew up in a world of motion and, and uh, service. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't matter how much money you had, what are you gonna do? You know, what are you gonna do for your people? Uh, you got a million dollars, give half of it back. You don't need a million dollars. Help some people who don't have anything. Uh, if you have a brain, what are you gonna do with it? Make money with it or help people with it? Uh, and so I, I grew up in a family where the primary obligation and the people you looked at as the most important were young people, children, all the way up. You know, my mother taught at elementary school, uh, all the way up to, uh, she directed student teaching at Howard University. Uh, you know, taught uh, Tony Morris and Roberta Flack and, you know, Mary Baraka, Leroy Jones. Before they were famous, they had to have a job, so they took student teaching, just in case, you know. Uh, but you took, you took your brain and you passed it on. Uh, you took your passion for education and passed it on. My mother taught school when she was 13 years old. Wow. Yeah, the minute you learn something, you taught it to the people below you. You know, you finish, you know, K through, uh, you know, uh, sixth grade, you get to seventh grade and you teach the kindergarten. 
Now these were in segregated schools. Yeah, at the yeah, time, yeah, of course, yeah, until yeah. Brown versus Board of Education came up. 1954 yeah. yeah. came up uh -huh, uh, in uh -huh. the Supreme Court. Right. And for those who, who don't know, and it ruled that separate but equal is unconstitutional yep. at the time. Yep. Uh, I think what's really, really unfortunate, it took many, many, many years, even though the decision had been made in 54, for schools, particularly in the South, to, um, to allow that to happen. But it's, it's, a mixed, it's a mixed bag. I was in Washington, D.C., and the greatest high school in Washington, D.C. was done by high school, all black high school. It had been a school training a, a talented tenant for almost 100 years. Uh, my sister went to Dunbar High School, and she finished uh, 25th in her class and got a four-year scholarship to Oberlin. Wow. And we were, like, very depressed because we hadn't heard of Oberlin. We thought she should have gone to, like, Smith or someplace like that. And so we kind of like, well, Oberlin's okay. Uh, she went to college, and she's 15 years old. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. My mother went to college, and she's 15 years old. You, didn't, you don't need white people to make you smart. <laughs> no, you you know, so you didn't. The, the issue was not our inferiority at all. The issue I had never in my for a second in my life believed that. What the issue was that there were people that thought you were inferior and had things that were rightfully yours, and you should go get them, right? right? And, but in the meantime, you build up within your community the most powerful, you know, successful, uh, strong organization, so you can sustain yourself, like all black schools and all black communities. And so within that, within the Jim Crow world, we did tons of stuff. We went to every concert. We went to, you know, we went to the Constitution Hall. We went to the, to the, to the old Vic Theater. We did Shakespeare. We did all that. By the time I got to the sixth grade, I had been in every museum in Washington, D.C., Fold the Shakespeare Library, all that stuff, National Portrait Gallery, all that. Every Smithsonian you could get into, we went to. We were not locked in a cage somewhere. You know, and, and that's what was lost with integration. Uh, I had to go to, to an integrated high school in 1956, Roosevelt High School. I also went to Roosevelt College. But Roosevelt High School was 20% black when I came in in the 10th grade. It's 80% black when I left. Wow. White people fled out of there. You know, and it wasn't because we were inferior. When they did school-wide tests, we were better than the white kids. That's why they stopped giving the tests. We were number one. I was number one in my high school in physics. I don't even like physics. But I could take a test because our teachers on the Jim Crow prepared us for biased tests. It never occurred to us that the test would be fair. So that, that wasn't even an issue. Like, of course the test's not fair. White people made it. Why would they make it fair for us? So you just learned it. You know, you, did, you, know, you, 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 know, you stopped in the middle of the spring. You said, okay, got to take this test in two weeks. And we stop and we do a test prep. And you go back to the real curriculum later. You ain't the curriculum wasn't the test. Right. The test was some foolishness somebody made up. Right. You know, they're talking about Robert Frost. We go back to Langston Hughes and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Right. You know, we do Robert Frost. That's on the test. Right. But what we love was Paul Lawrence Dunbar. You know, an angel robed in spotless white went down to kiss the sleeping night. Night woke to blush, the sprite was gone. Men saw the blush and called it dawn. That's Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I had to learn that in the second grade. Still got it in my I head. I was say, I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's, that was not a world of backwardness. It was a world where we had inadequate resources. Right. But you had, it, that meant that you had in your classroom at Banneker Junior High School, people with master's degrees in science, teaching you mathematics and science. People with doctorates who couldn't get a job at, at an institution, who were teaching high school and junior high school. So, you know, we didn't have all we had, and we didn't have anywhere near what we were entitled to. But we were not sitting around just feeling sorry for ourselves. We were building and preparing to take on that larger world. And that's the world I came out of. What happened in the 60s? Obviously, there was a heavy civil rights movement going on in the 60s, no question about it. Certainly with Dr. King and others, there was a lot of uh, uh, differences between him and Malcolm X and a bunch of other folks. What was your kind of involvement in that during that time? You know, if you're a young person, you don't much care about the fights at the top. Right? What you cared about was where's the action, right? And people don't quite understand it, but there's no better feeling than being able to get up and participate in something that you know is right, you know, that right is on your side, yep. to take on an oppression and win, right? And to do it with people like yourself, you know, and to do it with a sense of courage and enthusiasm that's uh, similar to being on a ball team or, or being a, a great performer in a play or whatever. Uh, 
And you did that because you wanted to get that out of the way. It never occurred to us it would take, you know, 50 years to get integration. We thought you could do that in a couple of years and we could go back and play, you know, go back, play cards, hang out, whatever. Uh, the only reason you had to have a civil rights movement is that after the Brown case, just a 9-0 case, nobody opposed, you know, uh, the, the uh, Brown case, right? We thought that meant, therefore, we could go anywhere we wanted because we had won. Sure. sure. Didn't happen. 1955, you had, well, they can take all deliberate speed. That meant that they didn't really mean it. So it means, okay, we got to do this the hard way. That's the civil rights movement. Okay. We won on paper. Right. You say, now you got to do it. And you say, oh, okay. So we had a slogan, free by 63. So we figured 10 years, 1954, 1963, yep. I'll be wrapped up. 1963, not wrapped up. No. Not wrapped up. And so you realize it's going to be a long, long time. And that's when the older people come and talk to you. They said, I know you got a lot of energy, but we were fighting this thing a long time ago. And you're not going to win it in five years. You may not win it in 10 years. But the fight is, the fight is what's important. You know, you do what you can do in your time. And that's the attitude I adopted by the time I was like 20 years old. It's like, okay, my summers are gone. My spare time is gone. You know, laying up on the beach, can't do that as much as I'd like to. Uh, I didn't go to a Final Four basketball game because of a demonstration. You know, a guy had tickets. You know, I'd come down to Atlanta and see, so I love basketball. Sure. Uh, I said, no, man, we got this rally. You know, and I didn't even thought of it. I didn't even blink an eye. You know, it would not have occurred to me to stop and go to a, to a basketball game, whatever basketball, anybody's basketball, if there was movement activity going on. And so for the, I went to Howard for a year. And after graduating from Roosevelt High School, uh, got a scholarship. But I was surrounded by people that knew me, you know, the faculty. They knew me since I was a little kid. And you never, ever want to be in that environment because they still think you're five years old, you know. So whatever you did was okay. So I didn't know whether I knew anything or not because they wouldn't give me a fair evaluation. So I had to go somewhere. Uh, and that's when I got, but before that, I hated, I hated the, the kind of, strictures of middle class life before the movement developed. To grow up in a, in, a, in a very tight middle class environment required a lot of social behavior I didn't care about, you know, parties and, you know, wearing ties and, you know, kind of being kind of stuffy. And I didn't like that. It just was not my yeah. personality. Uh, and so I didn't like a lot of the stuff in Howard, you know, fraternity life, all that business. You know, so I kind of dropped out for a year. That's when I went to work uh, as a mail clerk at the Pentagon. Uh, and as I, as I, you know, I'd mentioned earlier in that previous conversation, my favorite moment when I was working out at the Arlington Hall Station, Signal Engineering Agency, was I had top secret clearance. I mean, I could never get it today, you know, unless Donald Trump got it for me. Uh, but I carried, my most important task was during the, the fall was to get the World Series bets down for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I actually interrupted a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to get Admiral Lemnitzer, who was the head of the Joint Chiefs, to get down his bet before the ball game began. You had to put your money down right. before the game started. <laughs> so I'm running around like 12 o'clock and the game started at 1, and there's a they're meeting. And there's, I, literally, they're meeting at big room, Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I have to talk my way in because the secretary is looking at me like I'm a young black guy. Sure. And I'm saying I have to talk to Admiral Lemnitzer. I got to talk to him. It's really important. She's like, who are you? Just tell them John Brace is out here. Uh, so I get invited into the meeting in the joint. She's got a huge football long table with all the maps and all this stuff. And they stop. And I walk up like it's really important. And under my top secret folder is the World Series pool, right? And he's saying, who you got? I said, well, I like the Dodgers. You know, I'm cool. You know, he said, OK, Dodgers. And he slides this $50 bill up under there. <laughs> and I give him a nice little, like, ready to go, way to go, and walk on out. And people thought, this is the most important thing in the world happening in its World Series pool. That's, that's, know, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. the Pentagon. You know, a whole lot of just that and the other and underneath is, like, not a lot going on. Right, right. You know, they, and then I went to Roosevelt. That's when I got into civil rights activity. In, at Roosevelt College or University? Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in Chicago, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a great school. The school that was started, I'm only 15 years old when I got there. It started because of discrimination in the Central YMCA College. They had a quota on blacks and Jews. So the faculty walked out and formed Roosevelt University. And so the, we had a reverse kind of situation. 30% black, 30% Jewish, and even said, and those other people, right? So it, it was a activist school, the uh, demonstrations against everything. 
uh, in the cafeteria, a table like this, this might be the Ypso table. You had Bernie Sanders, he was around there too, he's in Chicago. Then you had the, the Communist Party, because Young Communist League over here. Then you had the Socialist Workers Party. Then we had our Black History Table, you know, the Negro History Club. They called us the Black Bitter Bolsheviks. Uh, and we wouldn't let you sit at the table unless you had good politics. Look how smart you were. You could sit around the table, but not at the table. And we argued and debate and read it all, all the time. Uh, nobody told us what to read. We read what we wanted to read. Right. So if somebody said, oh, you got to read this book, we'd all go get it, you know, whether it's in the class or not. Well, if you were taking the class that had better books in our class, we'd go sit in on your class. And you could do that at Roosevelt. You. you know, you just wander around the hallway and say, what's happening? Oh, I mean, they got a great guest speaker, let's go. And so you literally walk out of the hallway into a lecture hall and sit in the back and hear a guest speaker from another class. Nobody stops you. Okay. It's a wonderful education. The faculty got locked up. A good chunk of the faculty were hired because they got fired somewhere else. Chuck Hamilton got fired at Tuskegee. Charles Hamilton did Black Power with Stokely the Comet. He got fired from Tuskegee, Charlie Roosevelt. George Igus, you know, a great European historian, got fired in Philander Smith, trying to organize black cafeteria workers in Arkansas now. Why he wouldn't do that, I do not know. And they gave him 24 hours, like, go. So where's that? Roosevelt, Christopher Lash, uh, Jesse Lemus, Stoughton Lynn, all taught at Roosevelt. And they couldn't get a job anywhere else. I want to talk, before mm -hmm. we're going to, we could talk about these topics probably till next week. But yeah, yeah. so all of a sudden you came to UMass. Now you've been a professor of African American studies for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it wasn't a plan. People keep asking about my career. I don't have a career. I had a job for 45 years. Gotcha. Uh, when I went to school, there wasn't any such thing as black studies. It didn't exist. Uh, there were people who wanted to study black people, but there were very few classes except at historically black institutions. I don't think there were five courses on black people in white schools in the whole country. But I was going to do that anyway. And in Roosevelt, I studied with Sinclair Drake, uh, Lorenzo Dow Turner, you know, the, the founder of, of African American linguistics, you know, brilliant man. Uh, Sinclair Drake, who did Black Metropolis, and uh, again, the leading black sociologist, living black sociologist at that point. Uh, and so I was studying black people all along anyway. And growing up on Howard's campus, I'm surrounded by people who wrote books, so they gave me their books. So I'm, I got all this stuff anyway. Uh, when the movement starts off, it's, you know, we, I'm in core. We have, you know, demonstrations. We get locked up trying to integrate schools. We, we shut down the expressway. You know, we, we picket construction sites, organize street gangs and all. And when I... Finished up Roosevelt, you had to leave finally. They finally kind of pushed me out. You have to graduate. So I, found, I didn't have a major. I just took classes. I was just, you know, ducking the Vietnam War. Uh, so I just kept taking classes and said, you have to, you have to graduate. And I said, like, okay, but what do I do? And he said, well, pick something. So they, they literally grabbed me out of the hall and say, take one of these, your history major, take two of these, your sociology, take three of these, your geography. So I said, okay, history. But I didn't have a plan. I enjoyed going to school, and I enjoyed the movement activity that came out of the school. I get to Northwestern, and I'm getting paid to read books on African history. I'm really cool. This is really nice. I get a fellowship. I'm sitting around. I'm enjoying life. Black students in Northwestern turn the place upside down, and they come and get me to help them because in 1963, I had led a charge to run Mayor Daly off the platform at, in Grand Park. Right. So I'd been on the front page of every newspaper in Chicago. So people knew me, but I didn't think, I didn't think about myself as somebody that people knew. And so I think I'm anonymously reading books in the library, and all these kids say, that's the guy that led the demonstration. He can help us. And next thing I know, I'm helping lead, lead a takeover at Northwestern. And we had the 50th anniversary last year of a takeover that, that, you know, that they celebrated. And 100, 100 kids took over a building. Uh, and they got, you know, black studies and so forth. It's at this point after the King riots, when large numbers of black kids are coming into predominantly white institutions, that black studies appears. Nobody thinks this is going to last. No school wanted it. Uh, black kids came in not as integrating the place, but as making the place like them. So they weren't happy being at Northwestern. They said, how come Northwestern's all messed up? Not, I'm glad to be here, but the food in their cafeteria sucks. You know, and how come they don't talk about black people in any of the classes? So that's where the demand came from. 
well, I'm already doing this. I know how to do this. Uh, I've been reading this stuff all, you know, I had a Negro history club with Sterling Stuckey called the Amistad Society, which is based in the community. Right. You know, we had all this stuff going on. And so people are, students are demanding that the history and culture of black people be taught at colleges. And so I'm a grad student. I'm getting job offers once a week. You know, somebody's taking over a building. Can you come out here and teach a class? I said, no. You know, like, well, I want to do that. I might go for the interview just to see what it looks sure. like. But uh, I finally took a job at Northeastern Illinois State that uh, Teddy Wilson, who was a war chief for the vice laws, was at the job interview. And I got the job because Teddy said he knew me. And that ended the interview. He said, well, you know, you're hired. Uh, I taught at Northern Illinois University because they, they had the most amazingly talented radical factory of anywhere in the country. There were a whole bunch of guys that came out of the left and they hid out in Northern Illinois Normal College in the 1950s during the McCarthy period out in the middle of a cornfield where the thing grew into a university. And so I walk out there and give my really radical speech because I didn't want to work out in the cornfields and they start applauding. There's a whole bunch of white guys cheering, you know, arm struggle and, you know, black power. And I said, who are these people? He said, we look at, we're just one for someone like this, like, yeah, it's a left thing. So that's, so we got black history there and black, black studies there. Then I got invited to uh, University of Rochester with the, uh, there was going to be a, a black and white left coalition led by Eugene Genovese and, and uh, Herbert Gutman. But they fought all the time. I didn't like that. Then I got a call from Mike Delwell. Mike I knew from Howard when I was a freshman. Mike later was very active in SNCC. And then he came up to Massachusetts, you know, with Jules Chibetsky and Sid Kaplan, because he was trying to duck getting thrown out of the country because he's a Jamaican immigrant and he had to be in school. So to get a student visa, you got to be a student. So he ended up at UMass. Students demanded black studies here. And they moved from the English department over to New Africa House after the takeover in 1969. And Mike says, come help me. We started at the department. And so I came in 72. John. And I've been here ever since. We unfortunately have to stop here, and it may be pertinent to have you back again at some time because we didn't cover a lot of things. Yeah, I yeah, to cover. yeah, half an hour. Doesn't so I want to really thank you, sir, for being on yeah, the show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Amherst Media for sponsoring the show and hope that you will uh, tune in again for our next episode. Um, again, thanks to Professor Bracey for being on the show. You were really terrific. Thank you, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>